The following program is a CBN News special report called Homosexuality, a Christian View. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll hear from people on the front lines of this so-called culture war. As you watch this program, we ask you to remember we're all sinners in need of God's grace regardless of what particular sins we commit. As such, none of us is in a position to judge another. Jesus sums up what God expects of us in two commands, love God and love your neighbor. To hit middle school and start having same-sex attractions was just very confusing because I had accepted the Lord when I was a little girl. Right in the middle of this holiness code is a reference to homosexual practice. I don't think Christians have anything to fear from research, from science done well. They're like, oh, this is awful. You don't let him in the house, do you? They have been bullied since they were in junior high, and that ain't right. Hello everyone, welcome to the CBN News special report, Homosexuality, A Christian View. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Heather Sells. Homosexuality is an issue that is testing the church in America. Problems range from religious freedom to the church's role in showing God's love to all people. So after considerable research and prayer, we have chosen a few individuals to present what we believe is an informed Christian point of view. Homosexuality is mentioned in the Bible only a few times, so to carefully examine what the scriptures tell us about this issue, it's important to dig deep, and that is exactly what our first guest has done. I think like a lot of people of my generation, I come at the scriptural issues in an atmosphere where Christians are disagreeing with each other about how to read these. The first place in the Bible that we actually see same-sex intercourse mentioned is in Genesis 19 and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God's judgment on these cities. It's a very dark story, uh, one of the darkest in the Old Testament. These angels come to warn Lot and his family about God's judgment that is coming on. And the men of Sodom gather around the house and they say, bring these men out that we may know them. That's literally how the Hebrew goes, but it's a biblical idiom for have sex with them. We want to violate them sexually. One of the things that Christians believe, uh, historically, the way we have approached the Bible, is that you can't cherry pick passages or verses. You, you have to read it as a canonical whole. And so I wouldn't want to base a whole uh, doctrine of homosexuality on this one passage. I don't think you can do that. I think it's a narrative. It's not a law. It's not a prohibition. But I think the sexual element is, is in a sense, heightening the sense of sinfulness in this narrative. This is a story about humanity spiraling out of control. There's a portion in the book of Leviticus called the Holiness Code. It has intermingled what we think of as moral norms and ritual purity norms. There are prohibitions against eating shellfish, for instance, or wearing garments with two different kinds of thread, right alongside prohibitions not to murder or not to commit adultery. And, and, and right in the middle of this Holiness Code is a reference to homosexual activity or practice. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And so the question a lot of people have is, why do we continue to observe this one? This verse is linking back to the terms that were used in Genesis 1 and 2 to talk about God's creation of male and female. It's grounded in the, the creative work of God, the design of God for human bodies and human flourishing. And I think it's very telling that when we see Paul urging the Galatians, for instance, not to accept circumcision, at the very same time, he urges them to flee from sexual immorality. And so it seems that Paul is, is carrying forward that creational prohibition of same-sex sexual activity, even as he's also setting aside certain other norms for Gentile Christians. Paul's main diagnosis, if you like, of humanity is that we have turned away from the image we were made for, the image of the gloriously different other God, and we've turned to images of ourselves, fellow creatures. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. For Paul, that's a kind of vivid illustration 
of a plight that is true for all of us. We're all idolaters. And homosexuality is just an instance of it. And he goes on in the rest of this chapter to give other instances of it. So he doesn't single out homosexuality as though it's somehow worse than all other sins. Paul is talking about the life of baptized believers, and he's distinguishing that from the life of those who are unbaptized. He says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, and then the ESV translates uh, two words here as, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking about the act of coupling, the act of intercourse. And he's not, he's not saying if you feel yourself tempted in a certain way, if you feel yourself drawn in a certain way to others, that's sin. He's saying this is porneia, this is sexual immorality. Don't go this way because if you're a baptized Christian, that's part of your old fallen Gentile life that, that God rescued you out of. One of the things that people like to point out in current debates is that Jesus doesn't say anything about homosexuality. And if our faith is centered around Jesus who extended love to the outcasts, why wouldn't we expect that he would be extending affirmation and blessing to same-sex couples today? That's a kind of drastic misreading of Jesus because Jesus was known for not relaxing the moral norms of the Old Covenant, but in a sense heightening them. He says at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, you must be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And he points to ways that you know, we might be tempted to relax sexual morality, for instance, in divorce. He's asked point blank, you know, what do you do with this allowance for divorce that we find in the Old Covenant? And he says, from the beginning, God created them male and female. He's quoting Genesis 1.27 there, that design of humanity to be both male and female, a complementary pair. He says, therefore, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So he's fusing together God's creational design of male and female with God's norm of marriage. And he's saying these belong together. And so I think this is one of those ways where we've gotten ourselves tripped up. Just because he doesn't talk explicitly about homosexuality does not mean he's setting aside that norm. Current studies suggest that two to three percent of the population has a homosexual orientation. But one study suggests that 40 percent of homeless teenagers are gay. They say the main reason is because they've been rejected by their families. Christian parents of gay children are in a tough spot. For one mother, it all began with a letter. I received a letter from him explaining to me that it was something he couldn't keep any longer and that he believed him to be gay. He said that he was prepared to lose his family over it. I just remember, you know, of course, a sinking heart, but that I didn't want to do anything wrong. When my mom got the letter, she emailed me and she told me she loved me and that she needed to process it. I was conscious of the fact that, you know, it had taken me t 10 plus, well, about, you know, eight to 10 years to, to, to feel comfortable saying it to her and that I needed to allow her the time to process it fully. I knew what the scripture said and I knew how God feels about it. And I didn't know how to transcend the love of my child into immediately going into, you know, you've been raised in the church, you know, um, you know, this is not God's best for you. I, I wasn't thinking that was what I needed to be saying. I just began to seek as much information as I could. I contacted different organizations and, and just began to investigate what I could, could do. Once we did start speaking again, we really had to, she was learning something new about me and I had to, I was sort of, I had to learn what limits I had in, in really talking to her about my life. It was an awkward few years of um, dancing around something that was, the, you know, the elephant in the room. When I began to talk with close friends and, um, you know, they're like, oh, this is awful. You don't let him in the house, do you? There's not that acceptance of the personhood of, of the child, which I think a parent just wants that. 
I'm not ashamed of my child. I'm not ashamed of the person he is. He's an incredible person. You're still dealing with the typical parent-child stuff, and then you just have this extra layer on top of it. But I do think that the frankness that now exists in my relationship with my mom, um, because of the way in which I came out to her and, and has made that better. I no longer feel like the black sheep because I'm the gay son. And I do think that my relationship with my mom is a big part of that. I just feel in my heart when I began my quest is I'm a mom, you know, and I love my child. So I was gonna keep loving him through this. And, you know, it's not anything that will ever be easy for me, but I've not rejected my child. In an extensive national survey, 16 to 29 year olds were asked about their perceptions of Christianity and the overwhelming response, anti-homosexual. And Heather, as you can imagine, this uh, proposes an enormous challenge for church pastors who are trying desperately to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with gays and lesbians, not to mention how to navigate through the issue of gay marriage. I had the chance to speak to my pastor about these turbulent times. If you had a same-sex couple walk into your church and say they would like to get married, what would your response be? I would say, I want to talk to you at length about this. This is worth more than a soundbite. And then I would share with them how I respect their conscience and how God is shaping them. And, but I, I also ask them to respect my conscience and my conscience would not allow me because of a, my view of the Bible to officiate this marriage. You would decline? Oh, I certainly decline, without doubt. Do you consider homosexuality as a sin? I consider, not only I consider, I, I think the Bible's categorical on it, that homosexual acts are unequivocally sin. But you, I want to add to that, so is premarital sex, so is pornography, so is fetishes, you name it. And the, the list is gigantic. So yes, it's a sin, but to isolate it out of, a, out of a larger Christian sexual ethic, to me, uh, is unfair to, the, to, to, to having a civil discussion about it. How do you, in, the, in that scenario that you've described, how do you then help the church better understand, better articulate what our faith says about the issue of homosexuality to the public? I would encourage them first to exhale. Meaning? Homosexuality has been around <laughs> in every generation and in every culture. So this is not a new phenomenon. Exhale, we don't have to defend God. The biggest part, George, is the attitude of the heart of the church. Do we love sinners? When you first began in the ministry, did you deal with these kinds of issues? Nope, never discussed. And when it was discussed, it was done in, a, in an unkind way. You have jokes. And you know, I, I passed it a long time. There are men that are effeminate, that are living celibate lives or are living heterosexual lives. And they have been bullied and pillared since they were in junior high. And that ain't right. How have you advised your leadership on tackling this issue? Right. The best statistics I've heard re is that about two to 3% of, of, of an average population would confess the same sex attraction. And um, so our church, that would mean we'd have 100, 200, 300 people that are coming to Sunday service. The vast majority would not confess this same sex feeling to anybody. Would you want to share your struggle with a pastor that's condemning, that's angry, that would be shocked? You see, until somebody can confess their sin without embarrassment or laughter, they're never going to share it with you. And if we're going to be missional in a postmodern world, we have got to exhale, process our philosophy of ministry, and see this as a divine opportunity. To me, I, to me, I think it's been a wake-up call. Because the church needs to, I think, reevaluate how we approach all sinners. Come out of the ivory tower. How 
you have a relevant gospel where you're still prophetic that right is right and wrong is right, and yet you're pastoral and say, I love you unconditionally, even without change. We turn next to science. There has been a lot of research done in the field of same-sex attraction. To answer the most frequently asked questions about homosexuality, we turn to someone who comes from a place of science and faith. There's plenty that we don't know, plenty that we should be open to learning, things that we should be open to researching. Uh, I don't think Christians have anything to fear from research, from science done well. I think the biggest misconception would be uh, the idea that homosexuality is chosen and it's not really recognizing that a young person finds themselves with these attractions and now, fit, yes, does face choices. You know, how will I live my life in light of what I experience? But I think to declare that the attractions themselves were a choice, I think, is a, is a mistake and a very common one. One of the most frequently asked questions I receive is what causes homosexuality. It's usually framed back as it's nature versus nurture. And people will study, you know, regions of the X chromosome. They'll look at prenatal hormonal exposure, even like finger length ratio and birth order effects. And then that's often juxtaposed with nurture from the environment in some ways. And I would say the two most popular theories among social conservatives would be it's childhood sexual abuse or it's faulty parent-child relationships. If you do survey adults who are gay or lesbian, they would be more likely to point to childhood sexual abuse in their history. But most people who've experienced the trauma of sexual abuse as a child develop a heterosexual orientation. Similarly, with parent-child relationships, I mean, many people will report faulty relationships, difficult relationships with their parents, most of whom develop a heterosexual orientation. The conclusion today among most behavioral scientists is that we really don't know what causes homosexual orientation. There's multiple contributing factors from both nature and nurture. When we get to the question of whether sexual orientation can change, it's also a very complex question. I think for some people, they experience both attraction to the same and opposite sex, or they experience same-sex attraction, but not as strong as another person who might be kind of wall-to-wall -wall homosexual in their orientation. If you believe that orientation cannot change at all, it's an immutable characteristic, our data pushed back against that and suggested that for some people, there was change. There was an average change for some people, and averages suggested pretty significant change for some. I don't think that it was very often 180 degrees. I think that would probably be a mistaken way to think about that data. On the other side of the continuum are people who say that orientation can change if you try hard enough or have enough faith. And I think that our study didn't support that position either. Most people did not experience as much change as they had hoped for. In a recent survey, almost 173 million Americans identified themselves as Christian. Given current research, this could mean as many as 5 million Christians experience some kind of same-sex attraction. And Heather, due to the so-called culture wars, many of these believers find themselves in a no-man's land, unwanted by both the gay and Christian communities living in secrecy. I came to the study of these biblical passages about homosexuality and biblical sexuality more broadly as someone who myself uh, realized in, during puberty that I was attracted to the same sex. To hit middle school, sixth grade, and start having same-sex attractions was just very confusing because I had, had accepted the Lord when I was a little girl. I had begun dealing with same-sex interactions from the time I was like six years old on. I was reared in the church, and so I was full of guilt and shame. How do I grapple with my Christian faith? What view of these texts do I come from that won't just condemn me to live with total shame? I just kind of retreated inside of myself. I wouldn't tell anybody. By the time I was 12, I was an alcoholic and suicidal. When I was 17, I almost died from alcohol poisoning. A lot of late nights spent drinking coffee with my Christian friends, wrestling with these things, crying over these things, praying about these things. After years of, of crying and asking the Lord to take it away, and He never did, I got angry at Him and said, if you're not going to help me, then 
I, you know, must have been born this way, and I can't fight it anymore. And I just went into the lifestyle. There's the tendency for the gay person to be marginalized in the church. Often the result is, is a profound loneliness. Years later, God showed me what I had done, and I repented of that. After several years, it, it just, I was restless again. I was missing God. Church began to put forward support groups. I found a home group that I sat down with the leader and said, look, this is what I struggle with. Can I come? I was able to divulge without feeling I was going to be cast out or uh, rejected. The things that had happened to me and people began to minister the love of God to me. They didn't condemn me. They didn't judge me. And what I found out, too, was they loved and respected me. And I started to experience a genuine, authentic love that was so much richer than the love I was receiving from the lifestyle. There was a person that I knew loved me, and, and I proposed. And like a fool, she accepted. And uh, um, we are still married, by the way. Others of us have pursued a similar path and we have experienced no real change in our sexual orientation. And so for us, uh, the question has been, what might faithful, joyful, hospitable celibacy look like uh, in obedience to Christ? And that's really been my path. It's brothers and sisters in Christ, loving each other, supporting each other, helping each other. My identity is not in who I am with, and, and who I love here, my identity is in Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for joining us on this CBN News special report. We, of course, have only scratched the surface of this complicated issue, and so we invite you to dig deeper. We are posting the full interviews on our website, cbnnews.com, as well as other resources for learning more. From all of us here at CBN News, goodbye and God bless you.